Mike Kesey got mugged. Who? So, when we were sitting here last, uh, we were talking about how your mom had discovered the babies and how you got into paleontology, and um, you know, when we left off, Jack had just entered the rock shop. So, at, what happened after that moment? Like, Jack walks in, and then what happened? Okay, well, <clears throat> to, uh, I guess, lead into that, about three weeks before Jack walked in, we had a paleontologist, a mammal guy out of uh, Berkeley stop in the shop mm -hmm. by the name of Bill Clements. Okay. And he's actually still emeritus paleontology, paleontologist at Berkeley. But uh, anyway, he uh, liked our little attempt at a museum. And um, as we found out later, he was headed down to a fish research project down by Lewistown and when he showed up there uh, Bob Makla and Jack Horner were also on the site and being Montana boys and what have you he mentioned that they ought to come up and check out our little facility and, and give us a hand if they could because uh, he really thought it was cool to have a second museum out in the middle of nowhere doing something with dinosaurs. And you had set this little museum up in the back half of the rock shop that's still across the street. Still across the street, still <laughs> there today. The, uh, yeah, we had basically turned the back third of the, the building into museum. Mm -hmm. And so once the fish dig was done, Bob and Jack came up and uh, came in our little facility and we're looking around and identifying a few things that I didn't know exactly what were that sort of thing. We had a lot of mammal teeth from the White River Badlands Brule Formation. Where's that? Oh, uh, Nebraska, South Dakota. Oh, okay. That's just stuff that you and your mom had picked up? Actually, or? it was stuff that my mother and dad had collected back in the 20s and 30s. Cool. So that was a whole shelf in the case. And to this day, I am not interested in dentistry. Do we have those specimens? <laughs> Actually, they are in collections at the Old Trail Museum. Oh, okay. They are still, I think, in their collections. We might have gotten them, <clears throat> but there's some that I think they reserve for... For their displays and stuff? Yes. Ooh, well, we'll have a look. Um, we Patrick have... likes teeth. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the frustration with mammal stuff is Mammals are all identified by the number of ridges and, and holes that the huh. bumps match up with on the other teeth. And, and it's just looking at the surfaces of teeth under a microscope, and there's so much more to an animal than that. So I like to look at the, the entire animal, the bones, you know, where the muscles attach, all of that. So, yeah, mammals never did hold that much interest <laughs> in me. But uh, anyway, so <clears throat> there were a lot of unidentified mammals in our case. <laughs> but uh, Jack went through and, and Bob and uh, put identifications to a lot of the ones that were missing IDs and were, seemed to be favorably impressed with what we were doing. And, happened to ask my mother uh, if she had anything else that was really cool. We had just been out on site collecting, uh, again, some of the stuff that had been brought to the surface after the last rain. Mm -hmm. And she had a little box of them in the, the shop we had, she hadn't brought over to the house yet. Because we had actually just gotten back from that the night before. 
Anyway, uh, she showed Jack a couple of little vertebrae that she found, mm -hmm. and he got fairly excited and said, do you have any more of this? And she says, well, my son is working on the rest of it over at the house, so she sent them on over, and the uh, bones that we had collected, uh, for the most part, are the ones that are on display in our case currently. And I was a little bit conceited, I guess, when I put that display together because I laid the bones out in the case pretty much in the order that they were laid out when Jack walked into the house and saw them laid out on our living room table. So what you see in that case is pretty much what Jack saw when he first walked in. And one of the things that was a problem for us is there was no internet. The best you could do is interlibrary loan on books and things like that. And if you actually wanted to see dinosaur remains, as we talked about before, uh -huh. you pretty much had to pack up and, and travel thousands of miles. And again, mm -hmm. you know, jets back in the 60s and 70s aren't like jets today. It was a pretty major undertaking to get outside the state of Montana if you needed to. So what we had to go by was what we could see in books and what we could see in the you know, modern nature and, and what's going on on the earth today. Uh -huh. Just local observation. <coughs> so I had made the assumption that Museums don't have pictures of the the babies that they found in books because babies really aren't very impressive. They're not. It just looks like a bunch of chalk that we put in a case. And to this day, I, it makes me frustrated and, and amused at the same time. I don't know how many times I've brought people back into our gallery. And, of course, there's the, the big foam core model seismosaurus that we built a few years ago, standing in the gallery. A few years ago, it's 2018 now. <laughs> yeah, well, it was 1998's a few years ago. <laughs> anyway, the uh, res response for people coming into the gallery is almost always the same. You walk in, you see this great big animal that is According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the world's largest scientifically, scientifically accurate dinosaur on display. Mm -hmm. And you walk over to this case with this pile of little bones in it laid out as kind of a composite of an animal. And you tell them all about how these little bones changed the way the entire world understands dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And they'll almost always say, well, that's really cool, but man, is this big thing amazing. <laughs> yeah, so that was what we thought was happening back in 1978. We, we had no idea that the fossil record did not represent the modern record. In you know, modern record, you get a lot of young animal style. Yeah. You get a lot of real old animal style, not a lot in the middle. And when we were out looking around, those were the fossils we found. We found a lot of little bones, we found a lot of, you know, great big old bones. Not much in the middle. And of course, you can look at a skeleton even as a, a rank amateur. And if you've ever seen a variety of modern skeletons, you can say, okay, this is a femur, this is an upper leg bone, uh -huh. and that sort of thing and teeth, as much as I hate them, always <laughs> tell you what an animal eats and are very distinctive even at the, the family level. So if you, even as a two-day person out in the field has been shown you know, a few dinosaur teeth of the various families, uh, were to stumble across a, a tooth, you could probably tell the difference between a duckbill tooth and a tyrannosaur tooth. And, yeah. and because I had 
previously read probably everything that was readily available as far as dinosaur information by that time. Mm -hmm. The uh, identification of what we had laying there on the, the table as baby duckbill was not difficult. Uh -huh. it, it was duckbill teeth, it was little tiny teeth, it was in a little tiny jaw. Uh, we had little tiny vertebrae. The other thing is animals as they grow start out with very soft bone. There's no hard outside shell, if you will, uh -huh. on the bone until the animal gets older. So if you find bones that are fossilized that have no hard outside shell, they're either A, baby bones, or B, that had some major preservational bias that eroded <laughs> all the hard bone off the surface. Uh -huh. and those two are pretty easy to tell the difference between as well. So for us, it was pretty easy to identify. We had baby duckbill bones, and um, so no mystery there. I just assumed, you know, everybody had them. They just were kind of unimpressive. Uh -huh. Jack and Bob walk into the uh, living room and look at what I've got laid out, and. Bob's face kind of goes <laughs> white, and, and his eyes bug out a little bit, and he looks at me and says, do you have any idea what you have here? Well, my response is, uh, <laughs> based on your reaction, apparently not. <laughs> and you were 23 at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he says, <clears throat> these are baby dinosaur bones. And I kind of looked at him and said, yeah, so. <laughs> he said, they've never been found before. And he looks at Bob and he shakes his head and he said, Bob, you and I have been looking for babies out here for how long? And when we find them, they're laying on somebody's card table in the living room. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, a surprise to me that you know, baby bones weren't preserved in quantity elsewhere. Come to find out, it's probably because most dinosaur bones pre are preserved in sandstone. Okay. And sandy soils tend to be slightly acidic and over the years you know even mild acid will break bone down and, and cause mm -hmm. it to go away rather than allow it to be preserved. This area of Montana is absolutely unique in having those big fresh rocky mountains <laughs> built to the west of us and they were just in the process of being built when the dinosaurs were alive here. Uh, and they're all made out of limestone, right? <laughs> they, those, those reefs you see are all limestone, which is calcium carbonate, which is very alkaline. It's, it's, it's where we get alkali flats from. Okay. So what we've had is runoff water from the mountains, very, very rich in the, the basic, you know, pH stuff rather than alkalines or rather than acidic stuff. Uh -huh. So probably there has never been a time when our soils were acidic enough to break any of that down. At least since the Cretaceous. At least since the Cretaceous. Well probably actually since the <laughs> Mississippian but uh, we don't know that much about what happened before because those sediments aren't exposed yet. No they're 7,000 feet under the ground. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, maybe someday, probably not in my lifetime. Well, at I'm least I hope. Comment. I hope <laughs> not in my lifetime. <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing about all of that is we've had a, a unique preservation in this area, and it allowed those babies to be preserved where they, there's not many other areas around the world that have those conditions. So mm -hmm. that's the reason we have babies here.
In China, is their water alkaline? Is that why they have so much egg preservation? The Flaming Cliffs area... Um, well, I guess Mongolia as well. Yeah. The Flaming Cliffs. That area, I think, was a unique but fairly localized event. Um, and it was alkaline, I think, for another reason. It, Okay. It was a. It, it, it still had a, a carbonate component that was part of the source water. So, in that respect, yeah, it was similar that way. Okay. So, yeah. yeah it's, it pretty much takes that. When I worked out in Dinosaur Provincial Park, we found eggshell in two locations only in that entire park, and they were just a couple little pieces that were fairly badly eroded. Uh huh. But. The two locations where we found them were in association with unionic clamshells. So the okay, so so there was a little pocket of alkaline water around yep. all the acidic stuff. Okay. So that's kind of cool the way nature has such a broad diversity through time. You, you really have to take that into consideration when you're doing the research. Anyway, back to our story. Anyway, <laughs> so Jack's looking at the baby on the table. <laughs> and he says, would you mind if we did some research and wrote a paper on these? The, of course, we had no problem with that. This is what we're all about is furthering science and uh -huh. increasing knowledge. So uh, we loaned the babies to Jack and he took them off. Oh, sorry. My alarm is just going to get louder and louder. Oh, you're going to go sit over by him? <laughs> Only if you're not there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Jack asked if he could borrow the bones for some research and if he could also go out and, and visit the, the site. Mm -hmm. Well, by that time, Mother had come over and we had been visiting there for a while. When Jack asked if he could borrow the the bones. She grabbed the only sturdy container we had in the, oh. the house at the time. It was a old Folgers coffee can. So this is the infamous coffee can. Wrapped the bones in paper towels, put them in the coffee can, and handed them to him. Um, he asked if he could actually visit the site as well. Mm -hmm. And while when we got him permission to go out to the site, one of the other things we showed him was actually a really badly eroded skull that uh -huh. Lori had found. And it was only, oh, like a week earlier that she had found it, but we had been trying to preserve it. And of course, what we had to preserve with was shellac, and it's not very thin. It, you, it's really difficult to dribble and this bone was so powdery and eroded that uh, any little breeze come through would blow parts of the bone away that the bone was dust uh -huh. and I uncovered maybe an inch of it and tried to carefully dribble a little shellac on it and the, the shellac hitting it caused a, a, a bubble ripple in the bone uh-huh. So we had walked away from it. There's no there's no use trying to collect something like that if you don't have the right equipment, you just ruin it. Uh -huh. And we knew it was a skull because what was exposed there had teeth in it. And we knew it was a duck bill. Uh -huh. And at the time, since duck bills are the most common and and since it was just absolutely understood that the two medicine was an extension of the old man formation in Canada and the animals would all be the same, Jack offered to try to 
collect that skull and see if there was anything preserved on the other side. Uh -huh, so that, you could put it in your little museum. And kind of in trade for allowing him to borrow the baby bones and do research on them. A really cool thing was when they collected it and turned it over, it happened to be to an animal that had never been seen before. They named it Mayasora. Of course, that had to be taken away for research. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yep. And that yeah. skull's in the Museum of the Rockies now? I think that's where the, the skull is, but technically uh, now Yale claims ownership of it because that's what all their paperwork says. But okay. the problem was, you know, when we let Jack borrow these things, he was working for Princeton. Yeah. And basically he took them and, and just you know, put them in, gave them a, a Princeton number so that he could list them in, uh -huh. in his publication. Well, 20 years later when it's time to sort all this out, by then Princeton University has closed its paleontology <laughs> department entirely. They have given their collections to Yale. Uh, all of the original paperwork is, you know, in a commotion, uh, uh, you know. Uh -huh. So Yale, doing due diligence, uh, when you know, they were, you know, asked if you know the the babies were ready to be returned, mm -hmm. said return, they're ours. You know. Yeah, because Jack was a preparator. Princeton when this was all going down in 1978. Yes. Yes, he got the position at uh, Museum of the Rockies in 1980. So the first two years out, he was here from Princeton. Uh -huh. And the skull, actually, Lori, recognizing you know, holotype skulls need to be in in places that have uh, climate control and what have you, uh -huh. did donate the skull. But she donated it to Museum of the Rockies. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's a couple of pieces of paperwork. We've got one of them that says she donated it to there, but Yale's paperwork says it was theirs from Princeton. So, yeah. As long as it's in a proper collection and, and properly cared for. It really doesn't matter. As long as everyone knows where it is. There you go. So that's really where all of this started. The, uh, we, Jack asked if he could go and do further research out at the site and we contacted the landowner. Landowner said, so long as there's no publicity, we don't care. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> take them out there, but uh, I said, you have to watch them. You know, we, we're we busy running cattle. We don't want people just running over our place, you know, uh -huh. whenever. So, you know, you, you need to keep track of when they're out there and, and make sure gates are shut and all of that sort of thing. So basically, we had to be out there with them whenever they wanted to go out. Uh -huh. And that was the way it worked until 1980, when some things changed. We'll talk about that in a, a while, but... Um, which, speaking of which, I'm going to switch the film. All right. <laughs> okay. So you're going to get two installments <laughs> to put on that. This is a good place to split for mm -hmm. part two and three. So... We can keep talking. <laughs>